Please welcome Daniel Miller here on stage. Thanks. Daniel, I mean, today it's uh, taken for uh, granted, but when you started out getting your first equipment and making some music almost 40 years ago, is it correct that you were part of the first generation of bedroom producers? Well, it was a, a, literally a bedroom production, yes. I don't know, I guess it was, yeah, because I think that was just around the time where you, the equipment became accessible to people uh, to do that. I mean, compared to what's available today, it was very uh, kind of simple equipment. Um, but actually really, you know, it was a four, I used a four-track tape recorder, a quarter-inch tape recorder and one synthesizer. And I think it really was a very creative, it felt very liberating, because all I'd ever used before was a stereo, so I had twice as many tracks. And it felt very liberating and very, very creative, yeah. And was your setup modeled on what other people had done before, or was it just very instinctly you got what you could afford and then tried your hands on it? Yeah, I mean, I, I got what I could afford. I, it was a, a TIAC 2340 quarter inch tape and a Korg 700S. That was your first synthesizer. Synth, which, was, uh, which I bought second hand, both second hand and. Yeah, that was really basic. No effects, no nothing. And just, I think uh, because it. You bought it second-hand, it, it arrived without a manual. Yeah, there was no, yeah, but I mean, that was a good thing, mm -hmm. because it made me learn how to use the instrument myself without being guided, which is sometimes, a, and it's a pretty basic as well, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Around the time you started Mute Records, there was a whole wave of um, newly founded, independent, do-it-yourself labels in the UK. But I think one of the things that set mute apart is when you put out your first record, it was a record by um, yourself, the normal warm leather it, mm -hmm. and you didn't actually intend it to be a label or to be a platform for other musicians. So then, how did it turn into that? When did you realize that you'd actually like to work with other artists? Well, it, it was a while actually, because as you rightly say, I had no intention of becoming a record label. I just wanted to put out one single and then see how it went. But what I did, I looked at other record sleeves and people used to put their, put their address on the back of the sleeve. So I thought I'd, well, I'd put my address on the back of the sleeve. So people thought I was a record company. I started to get demos, which was a very weird experience. I had no idea what to do with them or what I was supposed to say. Or you I, listened to them? Yeah, I listened to them, yeah. You know, and I didn't like them very much. Well, I... I <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I, th I thought they were interesting and they, you know, blah, whatever, but I wasn't, what, I wasn't thinking of starting a label, so I wasn't really sure. It was nice to have tapes and stuff, but I, there was nothing to do with them. And um, as the single be, kind of did quite well as an alternative, you know, in the independent world, because I thought I would just put it out, everybody, it would be ignored and then I'd just go back to work. But actually people seemed to like it, and that confused me a lot because I wasn't, really, I wasn't really prepared for that, uh, that situation. Anyway, you know, after a few months, I kind of had to decide what to do. I didn't really think of myself as an art, a recording artist. I just did... You were the, working in film... Yeah, I was film editing, yeah. And I didn't want to make m more records, really. But then a, f a friend, a mutual friend, introduced me to... F played me Fad Gadget demos, the first Fad Gadget demos. And those were the first things I, I found really interesting and exciting and kind of could really relate to them musically and lyrically. And I met Frank, who was, who was, the, who was Fad Gadget, and we got, on, we got on very well and had a few drinks and whatever, and I said, why don't we put out a single? And that was kind of the point at which Mute became a record label rather than just a, a, a vehicle for my single. And then you realized, okay, that's actually something I can, I can do. That's something that's mm. helpful and it... Well, I, yeah, I mean, I found it, we worked very close together on his early material in the studio, and I mean, it was his, he'd do it, but I was kind of, I wouldn't say I was producing it, because I didn't know, even know what a record producer did. I was just saying, oh, why don't you try that, why don't you try that, let's do a bit of this, a bit of that, and I really enjoyed doing that. I enjoyed it more than making music myself, really, watching, kind of, or helping to, to find, uh, for an artist who I respected to find their vision, to realize their vision was very satisfying for me. I mean, today, 37 years later, Mute 
doesn't really stand for anything. one sound. It's, it, it can be anything. I mean, it stands probably for your taste in music or the people who um, do A and R at your company for for their taste in music. But when you first started out, actually, Mute was one of the first electronic music labels, and it came across. I mean, the first couple of releases were quite purist in that sense. Is that something that just happened, or did you have a purpose? No, it was a very, very specifically what I wanted to do. I wanted to do that with my first single. You know, I grew up... Uh, listen, well, I didn't grow up, but, you know, when I had my teenage years, I was listening, started to listen to electronic music, um, experimental music, whatever, you know, different kinds of things. Also very into the music coming out of Germany in the late 60s and early 70s was a very big influence on me. And... Um, but it was kind of difficult to, for most people to kind of, you know, the kind of equipment that Kraftwerk had or Tangerine Dream or any of those groups was completely inaccessible to most people. If they wanted to make electronic music like me, that we would do like tape loops or, you know, white noise generators and things like that. And then sort of around 70, well, at 76, when punk started, um, I was really, I, 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 you know, I kind of was getting, I would, I'd lost interest in music a little bit. And then when punk happened, it really reinvigorated me because it, I felt I could really identify with the kind of spirit of it, not necessarily all the music, but definitely the spirit of punk. And what, what, what do you mean with the spirit? The spirit of, um, was, you know, that because, well, first of all, that anybody could do it, which was completely uh, kind of counterintuitive at the time because at that you know, there was a lot of very progressive rock kind of music going around there where you had to be technically very good to play, and it was kind of got very overblown and pompous. Or it was kind of West Coast, introspective country rock kind of music, which I really didn't like at all. So I was kind of disillusioned, and then punk happened. It was like a, you know, it was like a bomb going off, really. And it kind of inspired me, and then, you know, around that time... Uh, you know, synthesizers became a lot cheaper because the Japanese synths were coming on the market. The DIY thing was starting, you know, DIY records. So the whole thing came together for me very much around 1976, 1977. And for me, I thought that electronic music was actually the ultimate punk music because I think for, if you, with punk rock, you still had to... It was very kind of conservative in a way. You know, the line-up, the bands were very, you know, it was guitar, bass, drums. It doesn't really point to the future. It's it was, yeah, it was kind of trying to destroy a lot of the past by using the tools of the past in a way to do it. And for me, I thought electronic music was much more in the punk spirit of anybody can do it. You know, you don't have to be able to play any kind of musical instrument. You know, with punk, you had to learn to play three chords. With a Korg 700S, you just pressed a button and made a noise, you know, and for me, that was like... And if you had an idea, it was, for me... If, you know, I had kind of musical ideas that I really wanted to express, but I couldn't do it because I was a very bad musician. But I instantly was able to do that with the synthesizer because it was a very direct between the brain and the, and, the, and, and the instrument. So for me, I was trying to say, I suppose I was trying to send a message saying electronic music, you know, it's accessible. I was very excited by the idea of people, this next generation of people doing electronic music and see what would happen. And that was kind of part of why I wanted to be very purist at the beginning. I mean, the deutsche amerikanische Freundschaft must have sounded to you like the perfect embodiment of your idea of having this punk energy, but with electronic yeah. Uh, means. Yeah, and they still had a guitarist and a drummer, but still, they didn't sound like a rock band at all. And yeah, when I first saw them, I saw them in London, I think, supporting The Fall, and I got to meet them, and they were looking for a label to release their second album and the, you know the first album came out on At Attack Records in Dusseldorf and you know I heard the tracks and I said yeah let's do it you know let's I mean it was kind of really as you say and they were German and for me that was very important because of my the influence that German music from the early 70s had on me I felt this was the next generation of of that of, of that in, that embodied the same spirit as the as those earlier bands all labels at their time, they had a certain... I mean, Factory was a very Manchester label, mm -hmm. um, for example. Um, 4ED had a certain sound aesthetic. Um, but, I mean, what set Mute apart in the beginning was that the music was very electronic, but also the first signings were Fat Gadget, and it's uh, Boyd Rice and Duff, and they were all coming from 
different parts of the world. Um, so that was quite unusual for British label. I guess so. I didn't really think about it too much. I mean, I've always, you know, even, the, I mean, I was, I always felt to be kind of European anyway, rather than British. I've always felt more European, even though Boyd comes from America. But it didn't really occur to me that uh, there was anything unusual about doing that, about, about having artists from different countries at all. Especially with DAF, I mean, well, apart from DAF, where it was kind of, it was, had such a strong kind of connection to my historical, musical history, you know, as a fan. But Boyd Rice, I was, you know, that came from nowhere, you know, so. From the beginning, I think it was important for you to learn, to, to work a long time with the artist. That was your intention. Well, I, I, it wasn't really an intention, it just happened, you know. I mean, it, I didn't really have an intention. I thought it was at the beginning. It was very much record by record. Let's see what happens. There were none of the artists had contracts. Um, they were on profit sharing deals. Um, they could leave. Profit share means you do a 50-50 split after after costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they were on profit share deals. Everybody seemed happy. We, they were making the records they wanted to make. They were making the records I wanted them to make, or I hoped they would make. And so, well, you know, it just seemed that we didn't even discuss. You know, when you start doing a contract, you start talking about options and all that kind of shit. And it's like the time frame becomes much more, you know, much more formal. Whereas when you just, you know, when any of the band said, oh, I want to go and make another record. Okay, let's make another record. It wasn't like that option and all that sort of stuff to go with it. Can you first remember when you had a strong feeling of um, responsibility for one of the artists or for their careers? Well, I think this, I, I realized, this, you know, as soon as I started working with Fag Gadget, that this was very different f uh, for me because I, I was just, before that, I was just responsible for myself. And I did feel very responsible, maybe over-responsible, but I definitely felt responsible for it, um, you know, to, to get it, make sure that the record sounded as good as possible, to make sure it got reviewed and got played on John Peel and those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't that much to do at that time, but, you know, I still, yeah, I felt very responsible. And obviously, you know, they, you know, they need to make a living, you know, so. But when, when Depeche Mode came on board, um, there was a other than with the other artists you worked with before, there was a big interest by most of the other major labels in England at the time. So you must have felt a responsibility to do this right. And um, I mean, you felt that probably with the other artists as well, but yeah. you need to step up the game. Yeah, I mean, it was different with Depeche Mode because um, as you say, soon after I started working with them, uh, they, they, you know, they, they, there was quite a lot of hype around them and they got a lot of press and the gigs were doing extremely well and yet, of course, a lot of the major labels got interested and started making offers to them. Because I, we, I just, we just agreed, we'll make a single and see how it goes. And then all the major labels came in and offered them big advances and big promises and also saying, well, you know, Mute's a nice little label but you could never really have any, you know, in long-term international success. There's only three people working there, blah, blah, blah. And the band, you know, said, no, well, we want, we want to stick with Mute. We like Mute. We're going to stick with Mute for the moment. And I, and I felt kind of pissed off that these labels had said that we can't do it, you know, because I, I didn't know anything about the business. So I thought, well, why can't we do it? And, um, and so I was really determined to make it successful for the band and, and to make it work, partly because, mostly because they'd given me their loyalty to to do it, but also because I wanted to show that it's possible with a, with a label, with, but it's not a you know, tiny label, you know. It was important for you that you've never really signed a band because you think they could become successful. You always signed them because you just wanted to put out the music. Sure. But um, I think at some point you started also, um, if there was a band that you were interested in, one of the first questions you kept on asking them is, do you want to make a hit record? Well, not really, no. I mean, I think one of, the f one of the first questions, I mean, I think it's really important when you work with an artist that you have a, you know, you share a kind of a, um, a vision of where, the, where you want to be, where the artist wants to be and where you as a label think they can be. So if somebody like Boyd Rice had said to me, I don't know, Non, I don't know how many people are familiar with Non, but he was one of the original noise artists, really, in the late 70s. Great, really great guy. Anyway. If he'd said to me, 
I'm, I think my music can be, you know, can go to number one worldwide in the charts, I'd say, well, you know, I, I don't think I can do that, Boyd, I'm really sorry, but uh, I think we have a different vision, you know. And um, I think you could be a great underground artist. I don't think you'll ever sell many records because your music isn't that easy to listen to. And he might go, no, fuck that, I want to be, but he didn't. But I mean, so you have to start, that's an extreme example of where you, the you and the artist have to, to start off anyway with the same, with the similar ambitions. And of course, as time goes on, it grows and it spreads and it can change. But in the beginning, you have to, you know, otherwise you're immediately in conflict. And if you're in conflict with, a, with an artist, that kind of destroys the creative relationship. I mean, Mute was always known for, has always been known for giving people a lot of creative space. And I mean, once you have someone on board and you want to release their record, if I'm correct, you let them a lot of artistic freedom or they can basically make the record they want to make. Yeah, I mean, I think the point is that they're the artist, their name's on the record. I think we kind of have, to, as I said, you have to come, you have to be working together to agree on the kind of record it's going to be, or to have some idea of what that record's going to be, because then uh, we all know where we're going, but also it means that, you know, I or the label can help them to achieve that. We're not, we'd never tell them what to do, or how to write a song, or how to perform a song, but we might say, well, you know, if you work with this producer, that that could be better than that producer because for whatever reasons or, you know, that song, that's so great, that song, but you know, it's, it's, it's 25 minutes long. If it was maybe like three and a half minutes long, why don't we just try it? You don't have to use it, but let's just try, that's an extreme thing. Yeah. Or maybe the vocal could be a bit better. Maybe, you know, the vocal's good, but it, just try doing another one, you know, especially, you know, there's no harm in trying stuff out. In the end, the creative, uh, the creative result is completely their decision but there's no reason why. And if you have a good relation, working relationship with an artist, then you can have that kind of dialogue. I mean, it's different, a dialogue, every artist is different and every dialogue is different. And because some artists are very open and they go, yeah, sure, I'll try that. And some, if you want to, some artists, you might, it might take a month to come to that point of discussion and talking. But the point is, is that everybody's open enough to try stuff out and maybe like it, maybe not like it, but at least, Try. Can you think of examples where this process becomes um, problematic or where there's... Because, I mean, in the beginning, when you discover an artist and you want to put them out, I mean, you're very enthusiastic about them. But I could imagine, for example, once the second or third album comes around, maybe the um, artists have different visions of their music than, than you have. Or what also happened a couple of times in Mute's history is... Um, someone leaves a band that you've signed and starts a new one. And in most cases, you've also taken on the side projects or the other projects. And it doesn't automatically mean that you're a big fan of what everyone is doing. No, I mean, you know, there are two cases that are really uh, kind of known, which is one when Vince Clark left Depeche Mode. He was the main songwriter uh, and really was the leader of the band. And he left after the first album to form Yazoo. And uh, Nick Cave uh, left the birthday party, or didn't leave the birthday party, the birthday party split up. And he pursued his uh, career as Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. I mean, in both cases, in those two cases, which are very, you know, notable ones, I mean, I was clearly, uh, you know, I, I respected what they did. I, had, I knew they were super talented, very different kinds of artists, but, you know, I, I, I I, I had a real faith in their ability to, to, to move forward and create great music, you know. And sometimes that isn't the case. Sometimes that hasn't worked out, or somebody leaves a band that we're working with and says, oh, here are my songs. I go, well, to be honest, I'm not really sure if we can do anything with that. But I mean, it's, when the artists are as great as Vince Clark or Nick Cave, then you really want to follow, be part of their career and help support their career and, and watch it grow. You didn't just follow the path of uh, Vince Clark and Yazoo and Nick Cave. You also followed through with um, Recoil, Alan Wilder's project, or you followed through with, uh, I don't know, Crime in the City Solution, uh, where, sure. which were maybe less popular. They were less popular, but they were a great band. I mean, crime, for me, Crime in the City Solution, one of the kind of lost bands of Mute that, that never really achieved what they should have achieved. 
for lots of reasons, because most of the people in Crime is Easy's Solution were in other bands. And those other bands always took priority, so Crime is Easy Solutions kind of progress was very slow and kind of ultimately very frustrating to the point where Simon Bonney, who was the leader of the group, kind of retired, went, did some solo stuff and then kind of retired. Um, um, but, but can you yeah, give examples where it's maybe like a problem or where it turns into a problem to give artists so much creative space or when... I, th I think the problems arise when... Well, I mean, there are lots of... There are, of course, there are problems, yeah. But I think the, the problems arise when you give the space and they don't really know what to do with it. I, um, or when they change their minds radically over a relatively short... during the process of making a record. You know, I think sometimes people don't want a creative space. I mean, a really good example of that was when Yazoo split up and Alison Moyer, who was the singer of Yazoo, we had a talk and she said, you know, I don't want, cre I don't want creative freedom, I just want somebody to tell me what to do. And I said, okay, well, that's not me. I don't think that's me. I think, and, you know, and we parted company very, on, a very good, on very good terms. And she went to CBS, as it was then, which later became Sony. And I think the first couple of records were like that. She, was, she really had like classic kind of producer songwriters who worked with her. But then she got bored with that and, in the end and wanted more creative space. Which, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, that was a really good example. Somebody, she didn't want creative space. She just didn't want to have to make decisions. She just wanted to sing. Um, but yeah, creative space is uh, not necessarily a, positive, necessarily a good thing if the, the artist can't respond to it. I mean, I tend to try and pick, work with artists who I think will respond to it, you know. I mean, as, you know, we're not the kind of label who works with artists where you have to put a team of songwriters together and session musicians and producers. They're usually, the bands are very self-sufficient. And they write their own material and... I think there was a time in the 80s where, or early 90s where Mute was compared to uh, Motown. But in, in, in that regard, it's the, the opposite of Motown. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, you know, with, I mean, I love Motown, but Mute was anything, nothing like Motown. You know, Motown had a sound, it had this kind of team of songwriters and performers and session musicians. And, you know, we didn't, Mute didn't, I mean, I didn't, Mute didn't have a sound, really. It had, for me, anyway, it's about, it's not about a sound, but it's about a, about a kind of quality and about originality, which could be in a, you know, it could be Nick Cave or it could be Vince Clark, but very different people, very different kinds of music, but nevertheless unique and, and very special in their own ways. And that, for me, was what... Because I became very, as far as electronic music was concerned, I became extremely... Uh, what's the word, critical of, the, of, the, of where electronic music was going. I, I wasn't really, I think it, it, there was a, the initial kind of, kind of, in, kind of a p spike of, um, say, 1978 to 1981, 82, where there was an explosion of bands that came through. But some were commercial bands like Soft Cell or OMD or the Human League, some were much less commercial, but it was like a really creative period. And then I think, you know, I wasn't enjoying the new stuff I was hearing, particularly of electronic music. Particularly, of course, that I, I enjoyed some of it. You know, the bands like Knights Reb, for instance, who came out in that period. Um, but there wasn't that much, you know. And, and, and I didn't want to make rock, rock records, but I, I didn't object to bands who had conventional instruments if they used them in an unconventional way. You have a reputation of being very loyal to your artists, and I think, for the most part, also, artists on mute have been very loyal to the label. I mean, there's a couple of examples, maybe Alison Mouillet or, or Duff, uh, who, who left mute, but these are really exceptions. Why is that? You know, if it works, why, why change it, you know? I think from both sides, you know, if they, if, of course, you know, when an artist doesn't have, especially in the early days when they didn't have contracts, they could have gone at any time. And now, even though we do contracts now, not because I want them, but because all artists have managers and lawyers and it's kind of all got very boring in that's from the business side of point of view, not from the musical side. You know, if an artist wants to leave at any time, they, I'm not going to force them to make a record. And, um, and likewise, if I'm, if I'm not happy with the way it is, whatever the contract says, I say, look, this isn't working. I think we should call it a day, you know. So, but I think when you have a 
good working relationship and the artist is achieving what they would like to achieve musically and commercially um, and the relationship is good, why, why, why change? I mean, it's, not, it's loyalty, but it's also logic as well, you know. Um, I mean, at some point in the history of Mute, you sold the label to, to EMI, um, then you became independent again. And in the way, a couple of the groups that use, you used to grow up with or that are most known for being related to, to, to Mute, Dep Depeche Mode, Nick Cave, Moby, they've all... Mm -hmm left the, the label is... Well, is Mo, not Strictly, Moby still works with us in America, so Strictly, okay. yeah, we work with them in America, yeah. <laughs> is this something you regret, or do you wish you could have kept them? I mean, the f first thing is, you know, with Nick, and I, mean, I still work with Depeche Mode, actually, even though they're not on mute, I'm sort of working with them as an a and or whatever you want to call it. With solo releases? Yeah, with the, yeah, Martin Gore solo release and all, but with the band as well working, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're talking about what the next record, where I'll be involved in the A and R of it. Um, you know, even though it'll be on Sony, but I'm happy to do that because we're still, I'm still very close to the guys, and we're still very friendly, and you know, and uh, so you know that makes sense. Um, listen, we, I worked with those guys, both Nick and with Depeche, for over 30 years, and I mean, for me, that's such an exceptional. That was an exceptional 30 years in my life, and. I, I totally understand that they want to try, at some point, they want to try something else, you know, and it's, I respect it 100%. Of course, I love working with them and I would love to con continue to work with them, but I mean, it, you know, I, I'm not complaining because we had such a great kind of success, long successful re and creative relationships for such a long time. And if you look at this year, I mean, two artists releasing their albums on mute are um, New Order and Arca for example, mm -hmm. and um, New Order, they've been around as long as, as, long as you have. Yeah. Um, Arca is a very young new artist and one of the artists where I think, it, to me, he remembers me maybe a bit of the artist that you signed in the very beginning of Mute and he, his production, his, he, it sounds very much of the moment mm -hmm. and he's got a very unique voice. Can you, maybe with these two extreme examples, New Order on the one hand and Arca on the other hand, can you give an example how you, how you, what your relationship is to the artists and how you work as an a and Yeah, it's quite different actually. Um, mainly because I was, I was quite involved in work, the signing of New Order and bringing them to mute. Uh, but somebody else on my team was very responsible for bringing in Arca. And, um, but Arca for me, actually, you, you just said it. When I, f when I've, I first heard when, this, when Paddy, who's the a and guy, played it to me, I said, we've got to do this. You know, this is so, this sounds like nothing else. It really reminds, you know, this is what Mute should be doing in electronic music. I don't want to do stuff that sounds like other, other things in electronic music. It's very, electronic music is very precious to me as a medium. I don't want to kind of muddy the waters at all. And I want it to be very clear, you know. So, and for me, immediately, Ark, when I heard Arca, I said, we've got to do this, you know. And funnily enough, after we signed him, he, he discovered Fad Gadget. And actually, if you see his live performances, they really, really remind me of Fad Gadget's uh, live performance. They're kind of very extreme. Very physical. Very physical, very extreme, you know. Anyway, so, and, um, so we're, you know, we're very proud to be working with Arca because he represents something that Mute has been running through the kind of DNA of Mute since the beginning, which is kind of original, um, exciting. But A&R-wise, the difference is between... A&R-wise, I mean, Arca makes his, pretty much makes his records on his own. Uh, Paddy, the, the A&R guy, works with him and will critique it and maybe he'll change some things. But in terms of the A&R relationship, he's kind of self-contained. And he's, you know, we, and we'd have, we'd see no reason to get, interfere because he's doing great stuff. Of course, he'll play it to us and we'll talk about it, but in the end, he's making it. New Order was slightly different. Um, obviously, they were on factory records for many years um, and came from Joy Division. And then when factory records sold, they ended up on Warner Brothers, uh, made a few records on Warner Brothers but they hadn't made anything, they hadn't made a new record for over 10 years. And they got into a position where they decided to make a new record. And they felt that they wanted to have a, a 
kind of work with a smaller label again, where it was more kind of less corporate for whatever reasons. I'm not sure, I, I mean, they, for their own reasons anyway. And through mutual, you know, I'm, I'd known the band over the years, not very well, but we'd met at gigs and stuff like that, but I didn't know them that well. And a mutual friend told me that they were, look, they were looking for something, so I immediately got in touch with, with them and we met and we got on very well. They'd already started making the record. Um, I, the, the point that I became involved, they had kind of some basic backing tracks, no vocals. They'd already started working with Tom Rowland from, uh, from Chemical Brothers. So they were on the, on the process. And I mean, the first thing, I, you know, they, I went to meet them, we had a really nice talk, and they instantly said, do you want to listen to some music? I'll send you, we'll send you everything we've done, which I found very refreshing. You know, they weren't protective at all. They weren't, they weren't saying, oh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll play you one or two tracks, or, well, if you want us, take us, but we're not going to play, you know. No, there was, they, they played the music, and I, I, you know, just instrumentals, and I immediately really thought this could be a great album, so. Because I, what I wouldn't have wanted to do was do, if there was kind of a new order who wanted to just cash in or we're not, make, we're not doing great stuff anymore. Because I was a big fan. I'm a big fan. It had to be that there was going to be a great album for, you know, for me to get involved because otherwise it would have been too painful. So, I said, so, so yeah, we just said yes. And I mean, my role, at, I think my role in a and r that record, I, may, I never really use the word A&Ring. It's just that it's on the, it's on the thing somewhere, isn't it? Um, uh, I didn't have much creative input, but it was more about keeping the, the, keeping the train on the tracks, really, and making sure, you know. Bernard said to me, Bernard Sumner, who's the, who's the main songwriter and the singer, when we first met, he said, um, Carl Bartos from um, Kraftwerk had told him, you know, creati creativity begins with a deadline. And um, I said, no problem, I'll give you a deadline. And we stuck to it, you know, and, and, and I, he's, ne he's never, he's always regretted telling me that because I think he found the deadline quite hard. But actually it made, it made the, I think it's possible if we didn't have that, the record was, they'd still be in the studio. And so, so my job I think was to, first of all, keep, keep the process going, help with the song choice. And there were quite a few, in some cases, the, there were a number of different versions of songs, quite different versions. So we'd sit around and listen and so I'd say, I like that one. Blah, blah, blah. But I think, and, and, and they produced, apart from Tom Rowland's tracks, they produced the record themselves. They're very self sufficient. But we wanted to find a mixer, somebody to mix the record. So I came up with some people, that, and they decided on one of those guys, Craig Sylvie, who's a really great mixer. Um, and also Richard X did quite a lot of work as well. And um, yeah, that was, my, that was my role. It was really kind of getting the record finished and making sure it was good. <laughs> that, was my, that was my role, yeah. One of the things that has maybe set you apart from other people who run record labels, not just major labels, but also indie labels, is that you are kind of a technology nerd in a way, or a studio guy. So when um, you first went into the studio with Dippish Mode, I mean, you were the guy who told them, here's an ARP 2600, uh, maybe try out this as a sequencer. This is not the usual role of a guy who owns a record company. Mm -hmm. So um, can you tell maybe how your role in the studio with the artist has developed over the years and changed? Um, it really varies from, it's very different from artist to artist, you know. Mm -hmm. um, normally, I suppose if in very broad terms, I, I tend to get involved with the beginning, the middle and the end. So at the beginning it's about listening to the songs, um, choosing songs, maybe if it's appropriate, finding a producer, getting the project going. Then in the middle, it's like making sure, and then they start, and then, and then it's just keeping track of what's going on and making sure everybody's happy, make sure it's going the direction, but I'm not in the studio, really. I mean, I, um, and then mixing, I tend, to, I tend to get more involved with mixing because I think I mean, I know for myself when I was make, you know, producing records, um, you know, when you start mixing, you, it think, you know, you've been listening to those songs so many times that you sometimes lose a bit of focus about what the key things are in the track and what the key, you know, sometimes you lose the song in the mix 
And I think it's very, so I kind of I hang around and mixing sometimes and just make comments and tweaks and to make sure that um, it sounds as good as possible. And they haven't, and you know, and people, and generally speaking, that works because artists can lose, or the producers even, who have been in the studio for, for months on a project, you can lose focus sometimes of what the real, you say, well, that, you, you know, you, you, I worked on that hi hat sound for two weeks, it's got to be in there. I say, yeah, but it's not a very good hi hat sound. You know, let's get rid of it. You know, the people get attached to things, you know. Uh, and so sometimes it's good to go in with a clear head. Um, and I think when it comes to electronic music, you're, you've always been very much interested in the music that is pushing boundaries or where there's uh, a certain degree of experimentation and new things are explored. And mm -hmm. I mean, looking back at uh, listening to electronic music for the last 40, 50 years, um, I think that one instance where you thought that a lot of things were happening was when Kraftwerk first came around and this music from Germany. Then I think, I don't know, 15 years or so ago, you were really into minimal techno. Yeah. Has there been something more recently where you thought, okay, this is like a very like creative uh, period at the moment or something that I'm really into? I, I mean, I think, well, Arco is a good example of that, really. I mean, it's not a genre, but it, it's, it's set a new level for me about the kind of people we want to work with in electronic music. And I'm still very into techno. And um, uh, I still love that very much. But it's not new anymore, but, uh, but I still enjoy it, yeah. Okay. And in 2003, the British newspaper, The Guardian, um, asked you what kind of... Did they? Yeah, tech <laughs> are you interested in? They did a questionnaire with, with, okay. with you, and you said, well, this, uh, there was 12, 13 years ago, this, these uh, two companies from Berlin, Ableton and Native Instruments, and I quite dig what they are doing. Yeah. And I think 15, you know, what, 12, 12 years later, you're still using them to produce music and the other to DJ music. But is there something like more recently that's been really exciting you uh, when it comes to software or hardware? Well, yeah, I still, I mean, I still use Ableton Live and Native Instruments. I mean, the new Reactor 6, which has just come out, which is great, fantastic. And Ableton, you know, for me, when able, I mean, I'm not saying this because this is a, an Ableton event, but um, apparently I was one of the first 10 people to buy Ableton Live. So I found that out when I, once in that time, I've had to do, uh, had to phone up for tech support, and they must have looked me up on the computer and somewhere. You were very far down the list. I was very far down the list. I was either eight or nine, I don't know. But um, anyway, so... For me, yeah, so those, those, and I was also, for a while, I was uh, on the, um, I was a shareholder in Native Instruments and on the advisory board for quite a long time as well. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the people. And actually, I'm, I'm, I've also, I've really cut down on the number of plugins that I use. I've, I'm, I've never been a big, I've always, I think, it's, I think when you're making electronic music, I think it's really important that you create your own sounds. And if possible, if you have the ability to create your own instruments in Reactor or Max or whatever, but a lot of people don't, don't want to do that. But I'm very anti-preset. And um, I think that uh, and that was something, some of the rules that we used very early on with the Tepesh album, we would never use presets. Because I think, it, I think it's very important if you're going to really have your own sound, you have to make your own sounds. You can't use somebody else's sounds. And I think even though that sound isn't necessarily technically as good as a preset, it's your sound and it gives you the character sound, gives your, you as an artist the, the character, you know, your own unique character, which you'll never get if you use, if you use presets. Um, it's my opinion, you know, not everybody agrees with me. But, and obviously presets are great if you're working under very big time pressure, if you're doing a f commercial work or film work. But if you're a recording artist, I think you should be doing electronic music, you should be really making your own sounds, you know. And I think you can get lost in software, you know, you can get lost with all these plugins and you just, you jump from one plugin to another, you never really get to know one of any of them properly. And, you know, with the Korg 700S, when I started, I got, I knew everything about that. Very simple synthesizer, but I knew how to get stuff out of it that I'm sure was never intended. And the same with the ARP 2600, I mean, that's a much more flexible instrument, but still I worked, I spent a lot of time just figuring it out and trying stuff out. But with plugins, you just, you know, you have 100 plugins, you just jump from one to the other, you have presets. You, I don't think people really, 
a lot of people don't come to, can really learn how to use those and get the best out of them. I mean, one of our bands, uh, great band, Liars, who you know were basically for, me, for for most of their career up till a couple of albums ago were a guitar-based band. Just said, look, we want to um, we want to we want to make an electronic record. We want to make we want to start to think about making electronic music. Um, should we get complete? You know, the native instruments complete. Can you get us complete? Well, I think was probably said. No, I'm not going to get you complete because it's great as it is. You'll get lost in it if you've never, you know. Just, just, just let, just get reactor, and forget the rest of it for the moment because you'll just jump around with all the gr other, other instruments. And they said so they really just use reactor, and they got to know it. These guys had never used a synthesizer before, and they got to know it really, really well. And they, because they were coming from a, they said, "Can you show us how to use use it?" And I said, "No, you find out how to use it. So then you'll create, you'll make your own." So they, they were creating sounds using Reactor that I couldn't, could never have imagined. So, I mean, it's, that's kind of, it's very important to, to have that focus and learn the instrument, you know. This reminds me of something um, Richie Horton told me, one of your long-standing mm -hmm. mute artists, and he told me that it took him quite some time to figure this out, but that, um, and I think it's a problem that's quite typical for a lot of DJs who are also producers, is that he said when you start out, you spend a lot of time being good at something, and when you release that record and you're lucky, this is what makes you known and this is what gets you DJ bookings. And then, especially nowadays, you spend much more time being away and DJing than, than making music. And then you make some money and then you feel the need to buy new equipment. And with this new equipment, you just spend far less time with than with the original piece of equipment you bought. Mm -hmm. And um, in the end, then, when you make another record, it makes you sound less unique and more maybe like a lot of other stuff that's, yeah. that's around. And he says that that's maybe a quite unique problem also for electronic musicians who come from that um, tradition where they want to do something new. Because as an electronic musician, you have to kind of, or you think it, that you have to be aware of which plugin is coming out and what's happening in, because the invention of new technology has also always influenced the music. So he said it's, for him, he's kind of um, jealous of someone like Bob Dylan who can just pick up his guitar and it will always be his guitar and uh, he can be creative in, in other ways. Yes, he's right. <laughs> What can I say? Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, it, 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 uh, he's absolutely right. And um, I remember we worked with a prodigy for a while mm -hmm. and they had a huge six commercial success with... Um, The um, Fat of the Land, Fat of the Land, Fat of the Land well album. Sorry, I'm getting confused with that. And the Jilted Generation. Mm -hmm. And the first thing, and Liam from Prodigy, he used a very simple sampling keyboard up to that point to, to make pretty much all the music that they did. I can't remember which one it was, a, uh, a Roland. So anyway, very basic one. And when he got the money, when he when he had all this commercial success, the first thing he did was he bought, he built an incredible studio, put everything in it that he could that he'd ever dreamt of. And he did nothing. He did no creative work for f seven years, and um, he just sat in the studio and got. And then he ended up making his next record on um, on Reason, mm -hmm. on a lap on one laptop in his in his bedroom with Reason, and he made the next record with you know and he kept it very simple, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think limit limitation is liberation. Mm -hmm. Four tracks is 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 a liberating experience to have just four tracks. When you're using Pro Tools or Logic or Ableton, you're faced with, you just pile shit on, then you're faced with this session with 200 tracks. There's nothing liberating about that at all. It's just, it's kind of suffocating, you know. And I think um, making decisions, which I find quite hard to do in the studio, as anybody who's worked with me will tell you, forcing yourself to make decisions mm -hmm. on a regular basis during, during the making of a track, I think is, a, is a part of, very much part of the creative process. Okay, we've got like eight or nine minutes. Um, so if any of you has a question, please raise your hand and then we'll pass a microphone to you. I uh, just wanted to ask you kind of about like silicon teens. I really love silicon teens. It's like my go-to Me like, too. album. Or not album, but you know, just, yeah. just the work. Mm -hmm. If you could maybe uh, give us some insight on kind of, like a whole, I love the whole con around Silicon Teens, you know, that yeah. you pulled, uh, which is like 
a lot of great layers to the simplicity <laughs> of it. I'll give, you the sh I'll give you a short version. So basically, when I first got my synth and my uh, four track, I just started doing all sorts of stuff, recording all sorts of things, trying out things. And one of the things that I did, I had an old Chuck Berry songbook, and I, I decided, and I was a big Chuck Berry fan when I was younger, so I decided to do, just for my own, just to see what it sounded like, I decided to do a, a version of Memphis, Tennessee. And it was just one of many things that I did, playing around with. And I was having a conversation with some people in the Rough Trade shop, who I was very close to, about cover versions. And I said, oh, funny, I've just, I did a cover version. They said, oh, let's bring it in, let's have a listen. I said, OK. I brought it in, and they all said, you've got to release this, you've got to release this. And I thought, really? So that's, so I decided, so I thought, OK, I'll release it. I didn't want to release it under my other name, The Normal, because it was kind of a very different kind of project. And I thought of the Silicon, I thought the name Silicon Teens, and I thought, well, who are the Silicon Teens? And I thought, I'll make up a group, you know, the first, it was billed as the first, was it the first, all, the, the first teenage, the world's first teenage electronic group or something like that, uh, which it was in theory because there wasn't one at that time, although in reality it wasn't. And then, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's it really. And, I, and um, it, was, it, was very, it was very funny for a few, for a couple of weeks. <laughs> and then the joke wore thin, but it was, it was you know, very good fun making the record and, having that kind of playing that game. I'm wondering if you have any advice for a tiny indie record label working on a new release. Would that be physical, copy, CD, vinyl, or completely digital? What, what direction would you recommend? I think it, it's up to a point. It depends on the, the kind of music you're putting out. Um, you know, if you're putting out dance music, you know, digit, it's obviously digital and, and I would say vinyl. Um, if it's more kind of indie rock, maybe digital, obviously, for everything, whether we like it or not. You know, maybe do a seven inch single. I don't know, it depends very much on the kind of music. I mean, it's the CD, CDs, you, I mean, you have, to, you have to really do everything, you know. I mean, uh, as I said, it depends on the direction of the music very much and where you where you think the audience is and who the audience are and the kind of things that the audience will, um, the kind of medium that the audience would expect it to be on. So the, I think my only advice is try and figure out who the audience is and then decide on the, on the formats, really. Hi, uh, you mentioned uh, a lot of the great music you've put out, out over the past decades. Um, a lot of the, what used to be considered back catalog has now moved on to streaming services which is this huge public library in a way, public uh, records, and which also gives the false impression that if it's, that everything's on there, well, I'm sure there's a lot of great music that's been produced in the past that's not on there and it might risk being lost forever. Are you worried at all about how to sort of preserve the legacy you've built, uh, the recorded legacy of? I mean, from, from, from Mute's point of view, um, I think, Everything's up there, you know. I mean, when I sold uh, the company to EMI, uh, they obviously own the catalog. And when I left EMI, I didn't take the catalog with me. A lot of the artists came with me, but the catalog stayed with EMI. And then it got sold by various, you know, but to, to BMG Music Rights, who own it now. Um, and we work actually. We work quite closely with them. Um, it's in my interest and their interest. From, from a personal point of view, I want to make sure that the catalog's well taken care of, and they overpaid for it by a huge amount, and so they need to try and get some of their money back. So um, they, uh, they need our help. So we work together on it, and we make sure that everything... I mean, the digital side of it's not a problem so much, uh, because everything goes kind of auto, almost automatically goes up on digital. It's more like vinyl. Kind of, you know, they they were out of stock of the Nick Cave catalog on vinyl for a long time, which was, you know, which was a problem. Um, so, yeah, it's in my interests and their interests to keep that alive. So we work closely together. I don't think I was talking to somebody the other day who, a guy called Bob George, who runs I can't remember the exact word, but it's, it's the it's a music archive in New York. It's a huge archive, and he told me that they're now starting. You know, years ago, you would have done every, that people transferred everything from tape onto digital, and now they're recopying their everything onto vinyl because they think the vinyl is going to be the most, the longest-lasting medium, 
the most play in 200 years, it'll be the easiest medium to play um, because it's so simple. And so they're now putting everything onto vinyl. So I, I'm much more interested in vinyl being available, making sure that that's still around because that's the, that's the, that's the media that's really going to last. Digital is kind of, you know, you have a slight hiccup in the magnetic fields of the earth and that can just disappear overnight. You know, it's not very safe. And, you know, everything was on D8 on DAT. Oh, you know, everybody said we've got to transfer everything onto DAT. Who has a DAT player these days? You know, it, it, it's such a fast moving technology. It's better to stick to, all, to use that technology, of course, but to also stick to the technology that's going to last the longest as well. I found it slightly frustrating sometimes that with a lot of the streaming services, you can't, for example, search by label. So if yeah, I'm interested care about labels, yeah. in, a, in a very specific label and I'm very interested in that label sound, this, I have to find out other ways to... Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's a whole lot of metadata that's not available digitally. The producer, the engineer, the tape hop, the, all those things that when you're my generation, you'd look at the sleeve, you know, you'd look at the, the vinyl sleeve and you'd think, oh, wow, I mean, what does an engineer do? What are those, who are those people? You know, you're kind of fascinated by it, which kind of drew me, in, drew me into doing it in the first place. None of that stuff is available. I mean, there are people, the Music Producers Guild in the UK, which is a very good organization representing music producers, record producers, who uh, is fighting for that metadata to be, to be involved. But I th yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I think um, as far as I know, none of the mainstream digital, I mean, of course you can do it on uh, Beatport or Juno and those kind of places, but Bandcamp. yeah, of course, but not the kind of mainstream you know, multinational ones, no. I think it's ironic, sorry, I just want to say one ironic thing that suddenly struck me the other day when I was doing a talk with somebody else. Um, I know we have to stop, but, you know, when we would, people now think they're more independent than ever, that you can just, they can make the records in their bedrooms, put them up online, but they're so dependent on huge corporations now, the, the biggest corporations in the world, to, they rely on them to, to distribute the music, and I find that very, when we were scared of working with major labels back those days, these major labels are nothing compared to Google and uh, Apple. And I think that you know, everybody should be very aware of what they think independent is when, they're, when we're all relying on those outlets so much to, uh, to, to distribute our music. Um, thank you, Daniel, and thank you.